Hi, this is Charles Matthews. I'm the architect here with Grizzly Bear Architecture and Design. Today we're looking at how to design a new house. How to design a new house. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, in getting started, I'll go ahead and give a, a basic overview. Uh, many people are really excited about the possibility of designing and building their own house. It, it seems like it's uh, primarily an American phenomenon, but the whole idea of buying land and building is, uh, is something that's really exciting to a lot of guys. <laughs> I know in talking with uh, different guys at different times, they always come back to the whole idea of uh, designing and building their own house. And so uh, it's, it's a popular idea embedded deep in the heart of many Americans. And so uh, it's in my heart. I know that I like to design and build my own house one day. Uh, so anyhow, what I'm gonna give you today are uh, a list of things to consider in uh, in designing a new house, seven uh, seven aspects of what it would take in order to know how to design a house. And I'm looking at this primarily from a big picture perspective, and it's for people who don't have that much of an understanding of the architectural process. And so. Uh, Hopefully this will ground you a little bit more so that you can get started well uh, and so that you would understand how to design a new house. So what we're looking at first of all is the uh, an overview. You establish guiding goals for your house. You determine your cost constraints. You find funding. You consider establishing a real relationship with a realtor. You acquire an architect, you design the dwelling, and you get approval from governing authorities. So that's the big picture overview. We'll go ahead and get into the smaller picture uh, aspects now. So number one, uh, guiding goals. If you start out with priorities, you're going to make better decisions. And these guiding goals, as I've termed it, termed it, are so that you can keep the things that you want to most definitely make sure that you have. Now, everybody has to make decisions as to what is most important to them in the process of pursuing things. And so the first thing you would do is you'd establish five primary goals that you want to achieve with your house that are the non-negotiable achievements. Now, these goals are the things by which if you did not do them, it would be useless to even start designing your house. These are non-negotiable achievements that you're going for. The next thing that you want to do after you establish the five primary goals I'm going to establish five more goals of things that you would like to have if possible. Again, the context of this is you have to make decisions and when you make your decisions you need to have a range of things that you're trying to achieve with the decisions you make and those decisions are based on factors like time and cost. Some of the decisions that you'll need to make may have to do with factors outside of your control, like what would the building and safety department allow and what would the, the planning department allow as far as if you live in a city that governs these things. And finally, in the guiding goals section, you would establish five dream goals of the things that you would love to have in the house. Now, it could be that there are overlapping goals between these but if you get the five primary things, that needs to be what you would be most happy with and without which you would not be doing the project. All right, so we'll move right along to cost constraints. Now, uh, 
I have another video on understanding the finances surrounding your architectural project and you can refer to that in the uh, how to architectural series but there are different things that come into play when you're considering the cost of the project so one of the costs of the project is loan acquisition how much is it going to cost you in order to get the loan do you have enough money to hire the architect at the beginning uh, prior to construction drawings to help you in site selection? Uh, costs of design are factored into that. One of the uh, aspects that some people may not consider is the need to do soils testing as far as bearing capacity for soils. You know, you could find this really beautiful, cool, interesting site to build on. And if it is uh, swampland, then it's going to take some considerable uh, foundational uh, st structure in order to be able to have any building sit on the property. And so that being the case, uh, you would need to be spending and realize that you'd have to spend more money in that kind of a situation than if you're building on better bedrock. And so we go on to uh, cost constraints and we include you know the cost of construction. How much will it cost in order to accomplish it? What are the final uh, fixtures, furnishings, and equipment that you want to have? Like uh, you want a home theater? You know, you need to be thinking about those kinds of things now. And it'd be helpful to have a, uh, to have a, a spreadsheet, uh, a database of all of these different aspects and items that would be able to help you to track the latest and greatest costs. And finally, we look at contingencies where uh, things are going to happen that you haven't planned on happening and you're going to have to pay for those things. Uh, some of those things may include like the, the general contractor you know, breaks a gas main going into the, the area. And so if that's the case, it may be your responsibility to pay for that. And so you're going to have uh, to deal with contingencies. So in considering the cost constraints, uh, an aspect of that is find the funding. You know, how is it that you're going to be funding your work? And uh, just uh, one of the facts and uh, some of the research that I have completed is that most millionaires never design and build their own houses. Uh, I think the, the stat has to do with them you know, those who are millionaires right now live in houses that are 20 to 30 years old and uh, they have never uh, they've never designed and built their own house and so to find a person who is able to be in that kind of a position from uh, from a cash flow perspective especially is very rare in modern day society limited few people are ever in a position where they can design and build their own homes so if you're considering this uh, then congratulations you are you, you're one in a very small group of people uh, and of course this is to some degree depending on the region that your house will be built in as we're continuing to look at finding funding, we, uh, you of course can save money. You would have had to be extremely diligent along your life in order to save the money that would be required in order to build a house. Uh, didn't used to be that way, but things being what they are, uh, the saving that is required in order to build a house is, uh, is really incredible. Uh, but if you can save and you have saved you're in a much stronger position than a person who is trying to find funding by way of borrowing money uh, another way would be investing 
and investing would have to do with aspects of considering, well, if you have a piece of land, can you build two houses and use the mortgage from the one house in order to fund the, uh, the other house? So uh, there are all types of creative ways of looking into the whole idea of funding the project. Uh, and so that is, those are some of the key things that you need to consider. Uh, by the way, if you're going to go this way, it's really important that you also factor into the cost uh, repaying your investors <laughs> so that they, they get their return. And I would encourage people who go this route to repay the investors early on. Uh, another aspect of the way that houses can get built are through construction loans. Although it's not as popular nowadays because banks tend not to be lending money for home construction loans. We may see a difference in that within the next couple of years. And as I'm going through this, it's the year 2014. And I say that because uh, the housing market is already in some regions starting to show signs of, uh, of a lack of housing being available. You know, in Southern California, near where I live, it is significantly low uh, at this point, according to uh, various realtors and investors that I have spoken with. Uh, and finally, your traditional mortgage. And the mortgage is, is a vehicle where you could roll into the mortgage the cost that it would take in order to both design and build the house. Uh, but sometimes banks may require that you uh, you show that you have skin in the game, so to speak, by way of bringing to the table, you know, you bought the land and you have architectural plans already created. And uh, I, I guess this would be a good point to say I am not a financial planner or an accountant or a lawyer. Uh, I'm an architect, <laughs> and so uh, I, I can't give advice related to uh, the financial aspect of things without saying this, uh, and that you should hire uh, uh, an accountant, a lawyer, a tax uh, preparer, someone who's familiar with the tax scene in order to uh, proceed in a wise way and prudent way with your finances. So I'm, I'm giving you my opinion on this. Uh, next, a realtor relationship, a relationship with a realtor uh, can be a, a really positive thing because they have access and can find properties. Now, if you see a property typically on a realtor website, uh, most of the time the good stuff that could have been on there has already been picked through. And so what you are doing when you go to a, uh, when you go to a realtor website, you are finding the leftovers and you're finding the top dollar price. And so it's like going to an expensive shopping mall in order to buy a house or to buy a piece of land. Uh, so it, having a relationship with a realtor where they are actively seeking properties for you and you may even need to be paying them something for that process. Uh, but if you have them looking for you, you're going to be able to get the potentially best deals that others won't even have access to. Uh, keep in mind that a realtor has a primary obligation to the people who list the properties with them. And so if, uh, if you keep that in mind, you could conceivably go to a realtor who, uh, who could be the buyer's agent. That's what you'd want to look for because you're the buyer. Uh, and so the relationship with the realtor can be helpful. I would just want to encourage you also to make sure if you're going to be buying uh, a piece of land through them that you would do so in a way that is uh, already got the funding secure. 
Uh, nothing can be more frustrating, especially if you're a realtor, and for you to go with people, show them houses, show them land, spend a lot of time with them, and then them not be able to pay for it. And so I uh, need to respect the time that the realtor has. So we'll go ahead. Uh, acquire an architect. Sticking with the whole alliteration here. Uh, you want to get an architect. Now, there are all sorts of things that you would need to consider in selecting an architect. But what you would want to do after you have found one, you'd want to hire him as an additional service to assist you in assessing the possible sites for your house. Uh, so if you bring the architect on from the beginning and hire him as an additional service, uh, he can bring the multitude wealth of information that he has available in the process from the beginning. Now, it, it may be that you have a certain neighborhood in mind, you've got the land, uh, that's great. But if you hire the architect from the beginning, what you have is uh, the possibility of getting the best possible soil type to build on, the best possible location as far as the angles of the sun, prevailing wind conditions, views, uh, you, you would just sit down with him and decide you know, what it is that you want to pursue. And in the process of pursuing those things, uh, you'd be able to establish your, uh, your, your goals. And he would be able to maybe even work with your realtor to find these properties. Because of his understanding of the zoning uh, requirements that a city may have or a county, they, the architect would be able to uh, automatically weed out a number of properties that would be less buildable. And so that decreases your cost. Now, it may not necessarily be in the exact location that you would want it to be in, uh, but you would need to spell that out with the architect as well. You obviously don't want to build a really nice house in a poor neighborhood, but you also wouldn't want to build a really nice house in a great neighborhood and then have it uh, have settling issues five or ten years down the road. So uh, having an architect can help you in assessing zoning requirements, reviewing land qualities, and guide you through the whole process. And now we look at the design of the dwelling where you, with the architect, establish a contract that will include construction management. And sometimes uh, people only want to do the architectural plans with the architect, and that's fine. You know, that, that's part of the specialization that has occurred over, over history. If you hire the architect uh, as part of his job to do construction management, the benefit to that for you is that he is totally familiar with the job and he can uh, work out with the general contractor who is not familiar with the whole process of you going through your hopes and dreams and uh, working through the budget issues. The general contractor who isn't aware of those things, uh, if he has a guiding force there in, in the place of the architect, that can serve to minimize your headaches as a, uh, as a future homeowner. And uh, because he's familiar with your desires, your goals, you don't have to be communicating that to another person. So uh, it all depends on the level of interaction that you want to have. Now, traditionally, architects and contractors, that, that relationship can be a, uh, a rather dynamic relationship, I could say. Uh, and yeah, I really appreciate good general contractors. And so that being said, though, for ones that aren't so good, ones that aren't reputable, uh, you as the homeowner may want to have one less headache to have to deal with. 
and if the architect is intimately involved with the whole bidding process, then the benefit to you in that whole process is that the, the architect knows what needs to be done and the general contractor will not be paid until he has performed according to the construction documents. And that's what the architect is for. He's there to help you get the construction documents made in a way that reflects your values, your priorities, your budget. And the last thing I, I would want you to do as a client of mine would be for you to spend time and effort, energy, money, and getting your architectural plans just the way you want them, and then have uh, have some guy who's not familiar with all of, all of the different inner workings of the design come along, suggest something, and it may sound good to you for uh, maybe a cost perspective, but after you've done it, you see the effects of it, or maybe even down the road, you know, a perfect example, uh, a situation that I'm aware of, the general contractor decided on a, a, a less expensive alternative for a house addition uh, as far as the finishing is required. He cleared it with the owner, but it just so happens that because of the change that was made, the house isn't going to perform well in an earthquake. If I, as the architect, would have been also hired as a construction manager, I would have been able to put the brakes on and say, you know what, uh, that's a bad decision because there, the, the house uh, sheathing is going to fail in an earthquake and it's going to cause greater damage than what you would have previously thought. So anyhow, that's that's part of the situation that you have to deal with. And so it's part of the reason why I, I would encourage you as a homeowner, as a, a building owner, uh, to hire the architect for construction management as well. Uh, it's not going to be that much of an additional cost. And it, they're already familiar with the building. They're already going to, if changes need to be made, they're going to be present guiding that process. So I would just say, you know, why not? Uh, another aspect of what you can accomplish when you're designing your building is establish what's called a design build contract. And it's, uh, it would be more specifically called an architect-led design build contract where the architect is the one who hires the general contractor and what this can do for you is if you are satisfied with the design and the budget the architect will be able to minimize costs throughout the construction of the project by way of avoiding what's called change orders. Now change orders uh, are a vehicle <laughs> a lot of times where a general contractor can increase the cost of the project for himself because he is, uh, in, in some cases, and th this, is, this is for contractors that aren't reputable, what will happen is they'll issue a, uh, a request for information and then they will need to, by way of uh, a, a failure to execute proper care in constructing the building, they'll request a change order. These kind of things can take time out of the whole construction process and, uh, and cost you more money. And so if you have an architect leading this process, it's going to be more beneficial to you because he'll be able to minimize the change orders uh, since the, the general contractor will know you know there's no need for a, a time delay. There's no need for uh, 
the delay that can cause by way of request for information uh, because the architect has a vested interest in making sure that things go well, they go on time, and, uh, and the budget is adhered to. So in all these things, uh, I, I recommend to my potential clients that they do what's called a construction feasibility analysis so that we just run the numbers and we uh, look at the various costs of consultants, of the construction by general contractors, uh, look at code impact, look at uh, issues that the county or the city may have, the planning department. So with all these things, uh, understanding the big picture on the front end as much as is possible and it's an analysis but it's not uh, it, it, it's more like a more detailed estimate uh, and it has a wider scope than just an initial rough estimate so construction feasibility analysis can be really helpful it would include the uh, program or the list of spaces their sizes adjacencies as well uh, if I, we have uh, three more things on the design of the dwelling it would include all phases from schematic design design development and construction documents and drawings uh, the approval of the project by governing authorities and the construction management and finally once the building has been drawn, the house has been uh, submitted, what happens is uh, and it, it's going to vary based on the region, the location of the building, but uh, various agencies will need to have their stamp of approval on the drawings, including planning, which addresses major overall uh, county or city-wide planning related issues, engineering, meaning can your property uh, respond well to the utilities and the infrastructure that's already at the site, uh, building and safety, meaning is your building designed in a way to where it will protect health, safety, and welfare of its inhabitants, uh, water department, uh, electrical and others. When I say water department, it may not be that you necessarily have uh, water department issues, but uh, part of what you you have to do is know that from the, the beginning. So I appreciate you hanging around for, uh, for this entire presentation. Uh, I know at times it can be detailed, but I think that if you address these issues early on, It'll really help you in uh, understanding the, the process of designing a new house and it will guide you in your uh, final realization to where you'll have the best end product possible. So thanks for tuning in and I'll be talking to you guys again later. Take care. Hi, this is Charles Matthews. Just wanted to say thanks for watching the video. If you have any thoughts or comments, feel free to leave those below. Visit our website at grizzlybeararchitecture.com. This video is one in a series of videos that address various issues surrounding architecture and our practice of architecture and grizzly bear architecture. And uh, if you have any thoughts or comments, I'd really appreciate those. Thanks.